Hi, welcome to Ethereal Mechanics video number 47. This is E equals IC squared. Uh, the audience for this is uh, general with a little bit of a math background. Um, sorry for my voice, I'm getting over a cold or something and my voice is a little hoarse. In this video we're going to discuss energy. We're going to derive E equals IC squared and we're going to correlate ether consumption to energy. First of all, what is E? E is the letter which represents energy in joules. Uh, joules is defined as force times distance. The version of energy we're going to be using was inherited into electromagnetic physics from Newtonian mechanics. So electricity kind of inherited a mechanical defini definition of energy. Um, but electrical engineers are usually more interested in power measured in watts. And power is the rate at which energy is consumed uh, which is joules, is, a watt is joules per second. Now consumed means converted to other forms, converted from its source into other forms like heat. Um, it's not wrong to use the term energy consumption. We use it every day when we talk of consuming fossil fuels. And there we're saying we're not destroying energy, we're just turning it into other forms. And just for your information, engineers use watt seconds as an alternative to the joule um, where one watt second is a joule, and that it also has an equivalent called the kilowatt hour, which is you know watts in time, watts in time. And but where's the connection? Ethereal mechanics video 21. I argue that ether is a form of fuel which sustains the existence of matter. And then later, in many videos, I say all properties of matter are electrical in nature. In video 14, all emissions can be reduced to watts per meter squared. Logically, then, the properties of matter must correlate to ether consumption as well. So let me introduce to you a quote-unquote thought character. Uh, this is Mother Nature's ether dozer. And what it is, it's kind of like a little bulldozer. It can apply thrust, and it's got a little ether scoop in the front where it scoops in ether and is able to apply force proportional to the ether. Now, this is just a metaphor okay for a force of nature and the question is what's the correlation between fuel consumption and thrust is there a correlation what is the correlation well what we're going to do is derive that from the energy point of view if we consider that mother nature uses her little ether dozers to build matter in the universe and let's take two coulomb charges these aren't necessarily protons they're not necessarily electrons they're just coulomb charges let's just generically say it that way I don't want to confuse anybody here now mother nature when she's building the universe she's gonna push that charge in from infinity and bring it to within a distance d of the other charge and if we use coulomb's model not law model to derive the energy now that's stored in this system, the usable mechanical energy that's stored in this system. If she lets it go, it's going to go and push something, it's going to do work. The amount of work that that charge can do is the integral from, inf from where she came from infinity all the way down to D of uh, the force times distance. That should, you know, energy equals the integral of force dot D. R. Okay, now if we do all the calculations, then we come up with that the energy in this system that's available for work is charge squared times the electrical constant. Okay, so now, but what's the inertia of the system? Well, if we use new induction, which is force is equal to Km, Q1, Q2, the acceleration of Q1, or acceleration of source target, target over the distance from source to target. Again, this is essentially F equals MA. So if we divide force divided by acceleration is equal to inertia in kilograms, and we can drop the minus sign because that's just the way one relates to the other, Q squared over D. Okay, now the reason why there's two here is because you got this inertial force inductive force acting on this charge and this one acting on this charge so there's two overall contributors that's the reason for the number two so the inertia of this system is given by this quantity now if we put energy over here and we put inertia over here 
And then you realize that Ke is equal to Km times C squared. So we substitute Ke over here with Km C squared, and then we take this side, we derive by we derive for this quantity here on this side, and we substitute one into the other, and we have the energy is equal to one half inertia times the speed of light squared. Okay. So what did we learn? The energy contained in the electrostatic force is proportional to the inertia of the system, formerly called mass. And the electrostatic force is only half the total energy of matter. Well, where's the other half? Well, if we consider that there's really no, when Mother Nature builds her universe, she doesn't have any walls to operate against. So she's got to get another ether dozer out there to want to push these two charges together. And at any given time, these ether dozers are going to be, if this guy is pushing this guy closer, then the amount of force, fuel consumed by both ether bots going to be the same at any given point to be equal and opposite. Okay, but we also have to consider that the electrostatic force, the repulsive forces of these Coulomb charges must be fueled by ether as well. And therefore I'm showing the little flames on the charges as they're opposing. And the consumption rate must be equal for all, actor, all actors for matter to be stable. Okay, then logically the ether dozers must contribute an equal amount of energy to the system. And so what are the ether dozers? Well in this case they're another force of nature, which we're going to discuss. Uh, it's going to be the magnetic force, obviously, or, or the components of what we call the magnetic force. We're going to get to that later. The reason why I abstracted this is I didn't want to get into the discussion of pretonic fields at this point. I just wanted to make the simple abstract analogy between ether consumption and matter. Okay, so what we have of our stable matters comprised of two particles locked between two opposing orthogonal fields where each field supplies half the total energy of matter. The total energy is now proportional to E equals IC squared. Here's the rub. It is my present belief that mechanical energy, the only mechanical energy you could derive from deco decomposing matter is one half IC squared. Why? Well, in order to make the system go out of balance, you've got to eliminate one force or the other. And since they're equal and opposite, if you eliminate one, you're going to get the benefit of one, but then you've got to remove the other. So you're not going to get the benefit of both energies which make up matter. That's my theory right now, anyway. So what's the consumption rate of ether? Well, from video number 23, we learned that the radial velocity of ether flowing toward an object is relative to its inertia object in kilograms, formerly called mass. So the total volumetric flow is the radial flow times the surface area of a sphere. So if we multiply this times the surface area of a sphere at radius r, we end up with this, which is a definition of flow of ether in cubic meters of ether per second. And this is interesting here. So what we're saying here is that ether flows faster at greater distances. And in the beginning of ethereum, this caused me a lot of grief. Um, is something else consuming matter before it gets to the, you know, is it dark matter, blah, 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 blah. Well, it turns out this is just an artifact of the fluid dynamics of ether. Um, this is only volumetric flow. We need to consider other ether properties such as density in order to get the proper ether, ether part particulate flow, which we got using the electrical analog, which said basically at every distance from the point of consumption, the total particles of ether are going to be the same passing through any sphere. Okay, that's what we got out of the electrical analog of video 23. So, but for now, this is a this is a volumetric flow. Um, but in order to get down to a particulate flow, we have to come up with something for density. In order to normalize the inward consumption, such that the amount of ether particles per concentric sphere are the same, passing through each concentric sphere are the same, we need a density that's proportional to some factor that we don't know yet, Kd over 1 over r to the 3 halves. Now don't get wrapped around the axle right now, these are just gateways, okay, and the reason why this is only a gateway because if our density is truly this, 
then as we go out to infinite distance we have zero density of ether which cannot be the case. So what this really is, this is the number of particles that are starting to flow inward at any given point. As you get to infinity you've got particles way out at the, you know, at infinity they're just stationary. Okay, and so we need to we need to mature these as we go on. We don't really know what KD is, uh, but we can, can come up with an astounding realization that the ether consumption only increases by the square root of the inertia of the object. Now that sounds like it just a bunch of words strung together, but this has profound consequences in understanding how we view the forces of nature as we progress. So let me explain that to you. Consider that we have a one kilogram inertia block of matter here. And that's going, to have, that's going to consume ether at a particular rate which is going to be proportional to the inertia of the object, the square root of the inertia of the object. Now if we put two kilograms at the same place, okay, and we go look out, and, and let me show you what this diagram means. This is, this is the amount of ether flowing in. I'm trying to do this volumetrically instead of by doing it particularly, but we'll get to that in a second. So at one meter distance, the volume, the, no, the n number of particles of ether that are going to flow in are proportional to the square root of i. Now if you double that mass at the same distance, one meter, and I'll show you the reason for the one meter in a, in a few minutes, the number of ether particles does not go up by a factor of two, it goes up by a factor of the square root of two. Now what does this mean? Why, why is this very important? Well, it means that if I have two one kilogram blocks of or ball, balls of matter here, and they're separated by, don't worry that these dotted lines overlap. I'm just trying to stick them on the page. Is their total ether consumption is going to be two times the consumption of a one kilogram block alone? But then, if you blob them together into a single ball, well, their ether consumption is only going to be the square root of two times one individual block, and therefore we actually conserve ether by allowing mass to clump together. And in present science, and this is our new property that we're, going to, that we're coming up with, it. the present science says particles will always try to assume the lowest energy state. It's great that these particles have sentient brains and know how to do that. In ethereal mechanics, it's much simpler. The forces of nature drive systems toward lower ether consumption. And this here is a, a metaphor for gravity use, using uh, ether bots. And black holes are just a means to store matter very efficiently. There's no singularity. There's no voodoo. Uh, this is who made the picture. And because of this realization that ether, uh, the universe goes out of its way to conserve ether. Well, I don't know if it goes out of its way, but there's a good conjecture video which is coming up next that describes well, what is the purpose of the universe. And we're going to use the car from Family Vacation as another prop. Um, later at video 49, we're going to go back into ether consumption and, and how it relates to fields. That was going to be part of this video, but um, it, it got too long. Uh, for now, since we don't know KD right now, which means we don't know D right now, let's take the volumetric consumption at the surface unit, at the surface of a unit sphere. This is not S as it was before, which is the particles per second. This is volumetric, which is the sink of ether in cubic meters per second. So we're, we're not multiplying it by the density factor anymore. And then what we're going to do is we're going to do this at a unit sphere which comes out to this equation here. So okay, so right now we're talking in terms of volumetric consumption. Because uh, we don't know how many ether particles there are right yet until we come up with a, a density uh, coefficient. So right now we're going to talk in terms of cubic meters of ether. And if you solve for I you end up with this equation here. And these little things here I mean they're, real, they're proportional to, they're not exact, they're proportional to. And we solve for S. Oh, I guess we really wanted to solve for S, not for I. And we come up with that is proportional to the square root of I divided by constant 6888. So we put that here, we put I equals, uh, E equals IC squared. And what we're going to want to come up with is we want to come up with the energy per unit volume of ether. And so we divide E by SV, and we end up with this factor here. 
And again, let me explain this. This is at one meter distance from the object. Remember, we're doing this over a unit sphere. This is the volume rate of ether in cubic meters per second needed to sustain a one ki uh, the energy of one kilogram of matter, which actually we're going to put the one kilogram in here. And when we do that, we put the one kilogram in for I, we come up with E over SV is equal to 6.2 E to the 20 joules per cubic meter of ether per second, which in megatons is 148,000 megatons per cubic meter per second of energy entering a one uh, meter sphere for a one kilogram inertia to sustain a one kilogram inertia. Now if we do the ad hoc thing and assume that one watt is required to maintain one joule of matter, then the energy density of ether can then be reduced to 6.2 times 10 to the 20 joules per cubic meter, which is 1.74 uh, times 10 to the 14th kilowatt hours. At 10 cents a kilowatt hour, assuming I did the math right, that works out to 17 trillion dollars per cubic meter. Now granted, if someone actually figures out how to do this, the price of energy is going to sink to astronomically low rates, which would be a good thing, I suppose. And I uh, just put this little uh, McDuck, Scrooge McDuck up there. That's from Disney. Okay, but don't expect it to be easy. Anything that sounds too good to be true, Mother Nature will make sure you pay for it through the nose, let me tell you. I've lived with her enough to know. Okay, so let's recap. Energy is proportional to the inertia of a block of matter. The ether consumption is proportional to the square root of the inertia of that block of matter. And the forces of nature drive matter toward lower ether consumption states. Now, these are just general gateways. As we get more into how matter works, we're going to find that there's a lot of small differences. Okay, although it takes 1.7 times 10 to the 14 kilowatt hours to maintain a one kilogram block in its normal state, Okay, you can also add energy to this block by heating it, to thermally heat it. But the amount of heat that you're going to add to make this, this cannonball molten is going to be a pittance compared to the energy just to keep it stable. Okay, because there was discussions on the um, ethereal mechanics info site about, oh gee, if we super cool something, won't the ether consumption go to zero? No, the thermal state of the object is inconsequential compared to the existence, the energy needed for the thing to exist to begin with. So let me put those things in perspective. So these are just general. Once we get down to the details, there's going to be perturbations of these that are going to show much, much more detail. Thank you. Thank you for your support. And don't forget to check out the ethereumechanics.info uh, blog site. I don't get on there much because I'm too busy making videos. And I also thank you all for your, your donations. If you want to donate, go to my website. Uh, distinti.com there's at the donate button For, forgive my website it's woefully out of date and I don't plan on updating it anytime soon thank you